I befriended Dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I live in a very special place far north of the mainland United States. I'm not gonna name it, but I know that some of you will be able to guess it. Where this story happened, there are wolves, and upright wolves too. And on top of that, there are these kinds of wolves that look more like dogs to me. They're giant dogs though, and they can spend as much time up on their hind legs as they can down on all fours. I made friends with one of those when I got marooned in the snow one winter. He became my friend, my pet, my transportation, and in the end, he was the one that saved my life, really. This story goes way, way back to when I was still young and hot, and it details how I wasted months of that young hotness inside a snowed-in valley with no one to stand in awe of my stunning beauty except the dogman. I'm just kidding. In reality, I don't think I took a shower once through that whole time, so I don't think anyone was missing anything. Looking back, I can joke about how hard it was to miss out on things my friends were doing and so forth, but it really bugged me and dragged me down back then in real life. So many of my realizations about and appreciation of the Dogman only came years after when I was looking back on all this. In the moment, yes, I was stunned and amazed by this creature. His appearance, his size, his intelligence. But even more, I would have to say I was stressed out and I was in emotional pain. I was scared that I might run out of food, especially once I started sharing it with giant Fido. I was scared I might freeze to death or something. It's not like in the movies where you always know the hero will prevail in Act 3. I was genuinely frightened that I might starve or freeze out there. Plus, I was quite miffed that I knew my steady at home was likely going to have already moved on to someone else besides me. The two of us had only begun seeing each other when I left, so we weren't cemented together enough to withstand me being stuck in the snow for seven or eight weeks, because I think it was something like that long before the dogman got me back to civilization. In fact, the boyfriend had moved on when I did. This location had been rumored to me to have strange things going on in it. One person told me there were vortexes there. I think that was the word they used, something like that. They were trying to say that there were wormholes or doorways or secret invisible passageways in that place that connected you to... I'm not sure what or where. Another person told me that the place harbored strange animals as yet undiscovered by science. Well, at least that much proved to be true. This person thought that maybe the animals lived underground, and that was why they were hard for science to prove or disprove. Well, whether they got there from underground or through portals, both theories seem to be telling me the same thing. I should expect the unexpected in this particular northern wintry location. The cabin belonged to my uncle, who was going to the States for two weeks that ended up being a lot longer when the winter storms hit. He didn't even get back to the cabin for a couple or three weeks after I escaped it. You know, my uncle was kind of the only reason I was up there, so I am grateful to him. I got to see things that people don't even believe exist, and that's only because he let me stay there for free. Of course, on the other hand, I never accepted his invitations to visit there ever again because I got married fairly young and we had children, one a year, for three years in a row. Although I love the cabin, and I miss the dogman that I made friends with, I loved my children a lot more, and there was no way I would ever bring them to a place where we might get snowed in or whatever. I mean, they're all grown now, and I'm too old to go back to the cabin. I mean, for me to go back now would be me saying goodbye. I mean, maybe I will decide to go up and see the dogman one more time. Once I know for sure, I'll be checking out soon. But I'm still trying to avoid thinking about mortality, even at my age. You know, I saw the dogman, even before the snows started. I thought it was a Bigfoot, as it was doing a very Bigfoot kind of a thing. I was going back and forth between my car and the front door, moving my things inside. 
And the dog man was standing behind a tree about maybe 100 feet away, maybe 120. It kept peeking out at me and then sneaking back behind the tree when it thought I might see it. It had bright eye shine, and I was surprised to note its amber hue. I had never heard that Bigfoot had amber eye shine. In fact, that is a color associated with the dog man's eye shine, but I did not know this at the time. When I got done unpacking, I went through my uncle's pantry, looking to see what food he had, and I found some dried meats. I brought pieces of the meat outside, and I looked over at the trees where it seemed that creature was still standing behind that tree, still trying to pretend that he wasn't standing behind the tree. I called out to him and said I had a snack for him if he wanted some. No response. I walked a bit toward the tree and heard a loud crashing as the dog man ran away in the opposite direction from me as fast as he could from the sound of it. That made me laugh that anyone could be so scared of me, let alone a Bigfoot. I mean, I still thought it was a Bigfoot at that time. I walked about midway to where I had seen him, and I left the meat slices in a little pile. The next morning was bright and cloudless, even though it was the morning of the upcoming snowstorm, which was to begin that night. The ground already had some snow on it from before I got there, so it was a bit blinding out. I thought I was seeing the Bigfoot in the tree line again, so I held my hand over my eyes to shield them from the sun, and I looked there again. When the creature's head peeked out from behind the tree, it didn't look like a Sasquatch at all. It looked more to me like a very thin bear, but with pointed ears. The more I watched it peek out, then retreat, the less I thought it looked like a thin bear, and the more I thought it looked like a dog, but a dog that stood up like a bear. Again, I went out with meat slices, and again the huge creature ran away loudly as I approached. This time I could swear I heard it squealing like a dog, whining is I suppose the better word for it. To me, the giant creature was cute in the way it was so shy. Of course, I hadn't seen it clearly, and I hadn't seen it up close. Not yet. So that night the snows began. I remember looking out the window and feeling a sense of peace like I hadn't felt since I was a kid. Then, in the morning, I woke up to see the snow had risen over every window, and I could no longer see outside. The feeling of peace was gone and replaced with one of claustrophobia and horror. I ran to the cabin door and found I could no longer push it open. The snow had piled up higher than the door. I couldn't even open it to try to shovel my way out. To try to shovel my way out because this door did not open in. It opened out. I panicked and I wondered if my air was cut off but the fireplace still seemed to lead up to the sky. That meant the cabin was not completely buried. At least the fireplace would prove to be an air vent. I hope that also meant that there wasn't too much snow on the roof. The last thing I needed was the roof caving in on me and crushing me. I was already feeling kind of crushed as it was. This cabin didn't have a phone, but it did have a ham radio. My uncle had written his own shortcut manual to using the radio, but when I started to read it that day, I began hyperventilating, and my heart started beating really fast. I just couldn't focus on learning how to operate a ham radio in that situation. So basically all I could do was go to bed and pull the cover up over my head. I didn't want to make a fire in the fireplace until I felt really too cold to deal with it, because I only had like four or five logs that I had brought inside before the snow cut off access to the woodpile outside. I didn't know how long those logs were going to have to last. I went into the pantry with some paper, and I started making out an inventory so that I could start to figure out a rationing system. While I was doing this, I discovered my uncle had left me a note telling me that meats, cheeses, and wines were in the cellar. I had no idea this place had a cellar. Uncle's note anticipated this lack of knowledge and instructed me to move the bed 
and the rug underneath it, then open the trap door. He then told me to be careful on the ladder heading down because it tilts a bit weird. I followed the instructions and found a really cold basement space that my uncle must have had to bend over to get through. Sure enough, there was a lot of food hanging down there from hooks, and there were racks of wine bottles along one wall. I wish those were all water bottles. Then I noticed a large supply of exactly that. So if I had to stay there for a long time, I was not going to starve, and I was going to have plenty to drink at the very least. If only my uncle had thought to store firewood downstairs. So that night, I woke up in horror to the sound of something scratching at one of the front windows. It was making a squeaking sound, as though something wet was rubbing the glass. I had been having a nightmare about frozen sea monsters swimming through the snow that covered the cabin. Waking up to these sounds was causing me to freak out and have a panic attack. I wasn't sure if I was really even awake, but I got out of bed and I walked to the front of the cabin. Soon, I could begin to see something moving at the window to the left of the front door. I didn't know what it was, but it was moving the snow around furiously. And then it seemed like two things moving very fast, and I grabbed a poker from the fireplace to make myself feel as though I knew how to protect myself, which I really didn't. Soon, a space was cleared on that window from the outside, and an orange glow made its way into the darkness of the cabin. It looked like the color of a burning fire, so I thought it was someone holding up a match or a small torch. As the window got wiped cleaner from the other side, though, I could see more clearly that the glow was actually two small glows, two glowing amber eyes. When I saw what was really happening, I dropped the poker in surprise, and I banged my toe really badly. I was seeing bright red for quite some time, but once I could limp over to the window, I started trying to lift it up and open it. It was frozen into place though, so I was unable to let the figure on the other side in. It was not my uncle coming to save me. It was not a human rescuer at all. The one who had come to dig me out was that dogman, the timid one I had been leaving food for before the storm. I went and tried to open the front door, but the snow was still blocking it just as before. The dogman understood what was happening, though, because he started tunneling toward the door. I threw a log on the fire to warm the place up, confident that between me and that creature, we'd at least be able to dig out the log pile outside. So the rest of that winter was kind of an escape from prison movie, starring me and my dogman friend. We would dig through snow in the sunlight, then retreat to the cabin in the evenings, where I would make a fire. I'd take the bed, and he'd hog basically the entire rest of the cabin, since he needed a lot of space just to exist. One of the ways I kept him being a good boy was by being careful how much food I gave him. I wanted him happy, but I also wanted him working for that food. It was lucky for me that he couldn't fit into that wine cellar, so he had no choice but to eat what I carried up out of there each day. We both had to ration. There wasn't any other choice. Fortunately, though, he loved cheese. I don't really care for it, so the dog man got to dine on the finest of all the things that I don't like to eat. One day, I was really tired walking back after we spent the day digging ourselves out. My foot had never really healed after dropping that poker on it, so I was limping every day. The dog man got down on all fours and walked alongside of me so I could lean on him. It made it hurt a lot less. After a while, he lowered his front half down to the ground, and I climbed on his big shoulders. He took me home that night like a horse, with me on his back. We started to travel that way more often. One morning, I noticed the snow was beginning to subside for the first time. It was soft in places and hard in others. It was icy hard in some spots after having melted the day before, but refrozen hard in the overnight. The ice was not thick in all places, though. 
and some of the snow was starting to get mushy. There was dangerous footing in either case, but the dogman decided to try to climb up on the top of the snow and attempted to walk around up there. We hadn't gotten our bearings since the storm, or at least I hadn't. On that day, I saw for the first time that we had been tunneling in the entirely wrong direction in order to get to my car. In fact, we could now see that the snow was melting down around the vehicle, and I could see the top of it sticking out of the snow, way back closer to the cabin than we were. That was such a happy moment. The dogman was as happy as I was. He stood up on his hind legs, and we went racing through the snow, with me laughing my head off. We'd run until he would slip and fall. I would fly off his shoulders and land splat in the snow. We both got soaking wet, but it was the first time that it seemed like there might be an end to this prison sentence in the snow. In fact, it was days and days before we were able to dig the car completely out and get it to run again. The trouble then was that the road leading back to the highway was still largely hidden under the snow and I was still not going to be able to leave yet. The good thing about that day, though, was that it finally put me into the mood to read the manual about the ham radio. I got through to someone who got a message to my uncle that I was okay. The next day, I got a message from my uncle delivered by someone telling me that my uncle had no idea that I had been in any trouble. He was tied up himself, having difficulty getting back to his cabin due to various reasons that I don't need to get into here. So all that time, there were never people coming to dig me out. The only one who was concerned about me was that dogman, the one with the glowing eyes. He might have looked sort of evil, but he was a good guy. And he always did more for me than I felt I did back for him. There was a morning when I woke up feeling different. I knew that was the day I was going to be able to drive out of there, and it turned out I was right. Looking back on it, I don't understand why I never considered trying to bring the dogman out of there. But that never entered my head in the least. I left him a few days supply of meat, I gave the guy a big long hug, then I drove away in my rental car, and he trotted away to his hoard of meat. I was just desperate to get back to my life and my friends, and watching TV, and listening to records, and all the other things I'd been missing so badly. The dog man, for his part, wanted to go eat meat, then return to hunting and foraging for a living. Although we did linger and hug a lot before parting, and there was a little sadness in that, we were also both very happy that life would be returning to something more like normal. It was an exciting day to get out of there, believe me. It really wasn't until decades later, when our youngest left home for college, that I started to wonder how could I have willingly left that dogman behind. The regrets only came much later, a lifetime later, really. I sometimes miss him as badly as I miss some human loved ones from my past. I wonder if he's still alive, or if he left us long ago. I don't even know what kind of creature he really was, and I don't know his lifespan. He never spoke, obviously, but he sure communicated a lot. He cared about me enough to dig me out of that prison. Or, <laughs> at least he loved fine cheeses enough to put the work in. I suppose we both helped each other survive the aftermath of that storm, but it was his idea. He was the instigator, and I suppose... Dogman saved my life that winter. When I became a wife and mother, I stopped thinking about the dogman at all. I never even told my kids any of these stories until they were already adults. Now looking back, I can't believe that I didn't share all this with everyone. After all, I befriended Dogman. The Oracle Lady Taidi, she's back at last. Her wisdom and wit have both come to pass. 
Please join us in thanking the Oracle Lady Taidi for rejoining our channel memberships and making this episode possible. She gets to enjoy our weekly secret uncensored dogman stories, and if you'd like to see them too, then listen to what our international TV spokesmongrel, Henry Lee Dogman, has to say. Hank! Thanks, Biggie, and thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button or Join our PayPal Subscribers Club at PeterBernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 Lascari. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after I think three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Scary, scary, scary stories. stories.